So, good morning again. Session seven. Let me get it up there. There we go. Session seven. This is the. Uh, we got one more week after this in the things which are, and then we move on to the things which shall come to pass. The third part the, of Revelation, the book of Revelation and its subdivisions. We have the things which were, and we know that's Jesus Christ because he always were, right? He always was. And the things which are, and that was the time and context of when John was receiving this vision from the Lord Jesus Christ. And that encompasses the letters to the seven churches. And now we're uh, getting ready, uh, and we will actually start next week somewhat uh, with the things which shall come to pass because even though they are now for us when John wrote it that was still a long way away so we're going to look specifically these next two weeks it's going to take two weeks because the church of Laodicea and the modern day church have a lot in common and so it's real helpful if we really take a good look at the church of Laodicea and, and see what their issues were so there's Laodicea. Colossae, uh, the church where we get the Colossians, the Colossae was real close. You can see this is only actually about 40 miles from Philadelphia. Colossae was real close. Um, but Laodicea, south of Philadelphia, not far from Colossae, midway between the hot springs of Heraopolis and the cold waters of a Colossae. Okay? And there was an aqueduct that fed these hot springs from Hierapolis. They, they, they had an aqueduct. And they flowed down towards Colossae. And when they passed Laodicea, these hot springs had become lukewarm by that time. All right? Remember, the Romans were real good in, about the aqueducts. They had, you know, there's still, there's testimonies all over the, the European world today because with their aqueduct system and some of them are still functioning uh, it's pretty amazing when you look at it if you guys have watched any of these shows on Nova or one of the one what was that we watched I don't remember really oh, it was about amazing. Petra that's right yeah that was amazing yeah so some of the things that they did uh, because if you think about it, we kind of take water for granted right I mean we can walk in here and, and get all the water we want and go to our houses and turn on the tap you know some of got swimming pools and so you got 20, 30, 40,000 gallons of water sitting in your backyard. But we have to think about, you know, we're very spoiled when it comes to water. The, the, mid, the, the you know, prehistorical man, wars were fought over water, and guess what? To this day, wars are still being fought over water. Even in this country, there were small skirmishes fought over water, you know, amongst farmers and, and people like that. But it's interesting, and of course, if those of you who have done your reading and you know about the church of Laodicea, you already know where this is headed about the lukewarm water. So remember, once again, that, that Jesus raises up churches where he will. And uses them for the purpose that he will. And when we look at Laodicea, know that Laodicea had been around for a couple of thousand years by the time John wrote this letter. But the interesting thing was they were never in a position in Laodicea to, to remember what we talked about last, uh, last week with Sardis, right? They had, you know, a, a natural defense on three sides. They had these huge thousand foot cliffs that over time had eroded, but it was still good defenses. If they had been vigilant in Sardis, they could have said, you know, they'd have had some people on the wall and could have seen people crawling up, but they got arrogant and cocky. Well, Laodicea was never in that position. They were very vulnerable to attack. And what that did for them is they, it put them in such a position that they were always willing to compromise. They were always ready to compromise because they knew that in the end of the day, they probably couldn't defend an attack successfully if it was a sustained siege. So they were quick to compromise. That was the way that they had developed over time. That was their mentality as a city, was, you know what? We're not going to stick to our guns if we don't have to. And that is very important 
when we look at Laodicea and its place in prophetic history. So the city was very wealthy. It was at the crossroads, and, and, and you guys have learned through your history classes in high school or college or both, that you know, towns sprung up on river centers back then and also crossroads, but crossroads where there was water. And on these trade routes where they would cross, cities would spring up, and they would be a huge economic power because a lot of merchants were coming through there constantly. You needed, you, needed, uh, you needed hotels for people to stay the night, inns, okay? That's, that's what you know, Joseph and Mary were looking for. They were looking for an inn. They were looking for a place to stay the night. Now, it wasn't the stay bridge, <laughs> and I doubt Vanessa would let us stay there because it doesn't have a, you know, a kitchen, the full kitchen, and you know, we're worried about bed bugs and everything else. But <laughs> they were an economic superpower. <laughs> I'm going to pull this down a little bit so it's okay, be easier. So. so in that superpower, they had a lot of gold refineries. Okay, they had jewelers. They had people that would take the raw gold from these merchants as they were passing through, and they would refine it. And then what would happen is as the other merchants passed through, they would sell it and trade. Hey, okay, so I get raw gold from her. I make a nice, beautiful ring out of it or a bracelet or a necklace or something like that. And then as you come through and you've got silk or spices, I trade you. So that made them very red, very rich. They also were famous for their textiles. They had uh, a huge textile industry. Beautiful clothing came from Laodicea. Finally, they, were, they had a famous medical school there. It was known for their ointments. They, and I'm not going to get into, it was like a calcium carbonate deposit that had some minerals in it that they would take from the local springs. And they had these ointments that they were known for healing. And one of their most famous ointments was eye salve. Okay? So that's going to be very interesting when we, when we look exactly what Jesus is telling them. So when the earthquake, there was an earthquake, destroyed Laodicea in 62 AD. Remember, this whole area is very seismically active. Remember, there was one that destroyed Sardis, or destroyed Philadelphia, almost in 17 AD. Well, there was another major one in 62 AD that did a lot of damage. But because of the wealth of Laodicea, they brought, and this is Tacitus. Uh, Tacitus was a Roman historian. And I remember when I was in Greek class, my uh, second semester Greek, my professor had a buddy of his that was doing a, t a, a speaking tour on the, the annals of Tacitus. He had done a lot of research on the annals of Tacitus, and he, was, he wanted people from his classes to come see his buddy. So what he did was he offered a full letter grade bonus to anybody that would come see this guy one night. I believe it was a Monday night from like 7 to 10. So if you were making a C, you go see this guy, you're making a B. You know I was there. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm real interested in Tacitus and the Roman historian that he was. So what Tacitus pointed out in this, I think it was second or third century when he wrote, uh, I didn't listen to the class. I didn't listen to the guest speaker. I was just there to get my B, okay? Because I wasn't, I didn't have a B. So what he pointed out was that uh, when the earthquake hit, that town was so wealthy, they did not need any help from the empire to rebuild. They were able to do it on their own. Now, you think about, we, what is the 10th anniversary that just we just everybody's hearing Katrina. about on the news? Katrina. Did they need a little bit of government assistance? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Laodicea didn't. They said, we don't need your help. We got this. Because they were very, very wealthy. So not only were they a center of the the jewel industry and the gold industry, textile industry, and had all these famous ointments. When you do all of that, what comes naturally to that? Bankers. They had a huge banking center there. So they had access to all the money that they needed, and they rebuilt that place on their own. The church was probably founded by a papyrus. And um, we see this in Colossians 4, 16-17. When this letter has been read among you, have it also read the church of Laodiceans. And see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. Now who Archippus was, is he was the bishop during this time. Epaphras founded the church, we believe. 
with some with some help from Paul. But Archippus, or Archippus, I, I have to look at the Greek to see exactly how it's pronounced, but Archippus, he was the bishop at the time. He had already started the church of Laodicea into some compromise. Why? Because that's what Laodiceans do. They, they know they can't fight on their own. They have no faith, so to speak, in their ability to hold off attacks. And so you have to know that if you're raised that way, to think that way, even though you're a Christian, that might sneak into the church because that's your culture. And how many of us are guilty of similar things, you know, of our, just because, you know, we, it may not say it this way, but it's our culture to do it a certain way. And so even though it may not be right, it's our culture. I was raised that way. My parents were raised that way. My cousins are raised that way. We're all, you know, this is the way we think. And it's hard to change your thinking, especially when you're a full-blown adult and you've just now been exposed to Christ. Well, Archippus was already starting to lead them down that direction, and that's why Paul gives him a little bit of reprimand here. Now, you might see that this is encouragement, but what you can also see is this problem. What, what is happening here is he is the bishop. Now, if he was fulfilling the ministry that he had received in the Lord, would Paul need to say this? No. So what this means is he was not doing his job right. So this was, you know, this was in about 60 A.D., late 50s, early 60s A.D., when he wrote the, the letter to the Colossians. So we are now talking when John is writing this to Laodicea, or when Jesus is writing it through John, we're now talking over 30 years later. Now, if you guys know, a lot can happen to a church in 30 years. You can take a church that is vibrant and reaching people for Christ, and in 30 years they can be absolutely dead. So kind of think of that in the context of the times as we, as we go forward. Oh, I'm sorry. And again, uh, the name means the rule of the people. Remember the Nicolaitans, that means to rule over the people, to conquer the people. And that was what Jesus was saying. You got the deeds of the Nicolaitans and that I hate. He said that to the Ephesians and you hate it too. And then... Then we started to see some compromise as the time we got, I believe it's Pergamum, when we got the, or no, yeah, when we got the the, uh, the compromising, and then, and then they started conquering the people. They started lording over the people, which we're told as scripture as, as, as elders not to do. But what happens here is the flip side. You have a rule of the people. In other words, I hate to say this, and I'm in a Baptist church, and I realize that, but I'm going to say it. This is congregational rule right here. And that's one thing that, that we as Southern Baptists, you see a lot, is congregational rule. And different churches have different varying degrees of it. But there's two, there's two common core here, items here. First of all, you never see that in the Scripture where the people get to make the decisions for every decision in the church. If you find it, please show it to me. I challenge you. And if we weren't Baptists, I'd say I bet you. But we are, so I'm not. So you'll never see that. And, and various churches, we had, uh, we had a church, and when we, we coined a term, it's called voting on toilet paper. Because this church literally voted on everything as a group. They, they, had no, they gave no investment powers into the, the ordained elders of the church. And they literally one day ran out of, uh, of voting ballots and had to grab a roll of toilet paper. So that's, we, to, we coined it. That was when we were actually at Brazoria, but it wasn't Brazoria, it was another church. Uh, but Brazoria kind of voted on toilet paper. I was looking. Yeah. So, but it wasn't them. So we coined the term voting on toilet paper. And that's what, if you ever hear me say they vote on toilet paper, that's what it means is that they give no authority to their elders to run the church the way the Lord has put on them. Because they are Laodiceans, they rule the people. It's like a democracy. And that's real easy in our society because we think of democracy, a representative republic, which is what we are. And that kind of gets into our church, and it shouldn't be there. We have to remember that, yes, we are Americans, but the church is not a democracy. It's a theocracy with Jesus Christ as its head. So there's the name. Here's the title, the Amen, the Faithful, and the True Witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So 
The title here, Jesus is pointing out that he is the, the beginning of the creation. This is, means he's the priority of the creation. It doesn't mean he's the first thing created. You have to get down in the Greek to see that. Commendation. What was the commendation for Laodicea? You said there. Nothing. Jesus had nothing good to say about them. It's con condemnation. You're neither hot nor cold. You are lukewarm. Now, we think about the hot springs from Hierapolis. A lot of people will take this to mean that he wants you to, that Jesus is saying here, either be cold. In other words, don't, you know, don't pretend to know me. Either be on fire for me or, or, or just be cold and dead. That's not what Jesus is saying here. And it's real easy to see that. In our context, the way we look at things, we're like, because that's part of our vernacular. You know, he's cold, she's cold, or they're on fire. That's become, that's not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying be palatable. Cold water on a hot day, ooh, that's good stuff, ain't it? I tell you what, when I go on my long, I go on some really long walks. Sometimes I, I carry a pack with me, but sometimes I don't. And when I'm out there for 7 to 10 miles and I'm just walking in shorts and a t-shirt and I don't have my pack, I don't have my water, about mile 6 depending on how far I am, it is oppressive when I start thinking about cold water. And for the last mile or two sometimes, that's all I think about. I'm like, oh, well, I can't wait. Oh, I've got that thing in the freezer right now. It should be nice and cold. Oh, my goodness, I'm going to have some cold water. But also hot water is good, you know. Hot water is real good. Makes good stuff with hot water. You make good tea. You can make coffee. Who, you know, and I know we all did it as kids. Get out there with the garden hose. Okay. You know, they won't die if they do that. If they drink out of the garden hose, guess what? We're living proof that you're not going to kill over dead. But I have a question. When that garden hose has been sitting in the sun and you've been running around playing, is that the best water? No. And it... It's wet, you know, but if you had your choice, okay, you would rather have some cold water, all right? And on a nice warm, I mean, warm day, you want that cold water. On a nice hot day, you know, give me some cold water. But on a cold day, ooh, nothing better than sitting in a deer stand with my thermos, okay? Steam, ooh, good stuff. What Jesus is saying is be palatable, you know, uh, be, be worth something. Instead of something that makes you kind of nauseous. Because, you know, lukewarm water, especially when you're really, you know, it, it's, it's kind of gross. You know, especially if you've got some minerals in it and stuff. And it's not just pure, you know, not these little things here. It's kind of nasty. And so Jesus is saying be palatable. The, the condemn, condemnation also is they said they're rich, that they've prospered, they don't need anything. But they're they're pitiful. They're they're, they're pitiable. They're, they're wretched. They're poor, blind, and naked. Now, everybody see this? Remember what we said about Laodicea. They were very rich. But Jesus says, you're poor. And this is, they say, I'm rich. You know why they say that? Because they were. That's why Jesus is saying that. They, they were rich. They prospered. They didn't need anything. You're wretched. You're poor. You're blind. What, do we, what did we learn was there? What's there? The sap. The sap. And people would come from all around to get this sap, these ointments to put on their eyes. And Jesus is saying, you're, you're blind as pets. And, and what else was there? The textile industry, the beautiful clothes? Jesus says you're naked. So everything that they think they are because of their pride, Jesus just takes them down and says, you think you're all that, but you're not. So they received some counsel to buy gold refined by the fire. Now this is, we think of this as some kind of a euphemism or, you know, allegory or something. No, this is, this would hit these Laodiceans home because that's what they did. They refined gold. But Jesus is saying that kind of gold refining is not what you need. You need to be refined by the fire. And who's the fire? He's the fire. Uh, so, and that's what makes you rich. And white garments so that you can be clothed, all right, and anoint your eyes with salve, 
So all those things you think you have are false. You have built yourself up on falsehood. You have fooled yourself. So their reward for obeying is to sit with me on my throne, and as I have conquered, and sit down with my Father on His throne. So when does Christ sit on His throne? When does that happen? Say it again, David. The millennial kingdom. Jesus is not sitting on His throne yet. Right? Remember what, anybody remember what the angel told Mary? He is going to sit on the throne of David. Now, that is future still. That's sometime in the next 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, however long it is, that's in the future. So what the promise here is, is that when the millennial kingdom comes, if you obey, and this is the promise I give you, you're going to sit with me on my throne. You're going to rule. And we know that from other passages that we shall judge angels and we shall rule nations. And that's part of our reward as believers. And depending on how well we handle this life is how much responsibility we're given in the next life. Okay? Some people are going to be mayors of Bonnie and some people are going to be governing the United States of America. That's a good way to think of it. So his prophetic fulfillment is 1900 to the present and it represents the apostate church, the dead church, the compromising church. And its application to us is take an accurate account of yourselves. Make sure that you haven't blown smoke up your own rear end. Okay? To put it crudely. Because we can, we can fool ourselves. I can fool myself. What Jesus is saying here is look at yourself in the mirror and check out every wrinkle. Check out every vice. And that takes, that's hard to actually look at yourself and go, okay, Father, allow that light to shine on me and show me all these dark spots and stains that I need to get out. Don't be deluded about where you think you are. Because, you know, the Bible says, let he who thinks he stand take heed unless he what? Falls. Right. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, that's a contrast with Philadelphia where he says, I set before you an open door. And actually what this is, standing at the door and knocking, is the final indictment of the church of Laodicea. It's the final condemnation. It's not just, it is something that we can look at in terms of evangelism, and we use that a lot of times. You know, you know, Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. If you will let him in. First of all, where's the doorknob? It's inside, right? It's not outside where Jesus can turn it. It's one of those doors that only has a knob on the inside. You have to open that. And Jesus can come and knock. But what the indictment here of the Laodiceans is that Jesus is sitting outside the church. Whereas contrasted with Philadelphia, he's inside the church. Because there's an open door and he can go back and forth. What here is, is what, what does Laodicea mean again? The, ruled by the people. Jesus is not allowed inside this church to give his opinion and to give his guidance because the people are ruling. And they're going to do things the way their tradition says and they're going to do things the way they want to do it according to whatever keeps them in power or whatever. And I'm sure many of you have seen it. Okay? You don't have to have lived long in the Christian faith and have been to many churches before you've seen this in spades. He who has an ear. Now, I said I promised you guys that we would look at this. It occurs seven times in the book of Revelation, of course, as part of the structure. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And, I and I, as I pointed out, that we see that, uh, that there's a structure change. Well, somebody, first of all, take a guess how many times this phrase is used in the rest of the New Testament. <clears throat> Just take a wild guess. How many times this particular phrase is used by Jesus and other writers of the New Testament? Bingo! Seven. It occurs seven times in the rest of the New Testament. If, if there's ever a question that I ask you and you don't know the answer, and it's a number, say seven. Okay? 
<laughs> because that's the chances are that it's what it is. So in Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamum, we see he who has an ear, then there's the promise. He who has an ear, let, let, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, and he who overcomes, I will give him the blank, blank, blank. However, in Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, we see the promise, he who overcomes, I will let him sit at my father, or sit down by my throne, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So let's talk about that for a second. Why would that be? Anybody got a theory? Yeah. Okay. First three letters do not have a reference to the coming of Christ. You do not see in the first three letters, Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamon, you do not see anything alluding to Christ's second coming. It's strictly straight up, hey, you know, this is what's going on now. But in these last four, you do see references to the coming of Christ. That Christ is coming. You know, he'll, I will throw you into great tribulation. You will avoid all the things that come on the world. You know, you're going to sit at my Father's throne. That's an allusion to the second coming of Christ. So, here's what we see. We have the apostolic church, persecuted church, the married church, the medieval church, the denominational church, missionary church, and the apostate church. So, what is the promise? What is the promise? What is our promise to us as believers? John, okay, eternal life. But what is the, okay, let's get specific. What's the promise of John 14? I go to my Father's house, and I do what? Prepare a place for you. So, and then what is he going to do? What's his promise? He's going to come back and receive us to himself. So there where we are, where he is, we will be also. That's our promise. And so what happens here is that there, the promise is the second coming of Christ. And so we, we see... Uh, let's go back here. So we see he who has an ear and then there's a promise. So the church here, and then we have promise at the end. Whereas here, because they relude to the promise, he puts the promise first. So there's a subtle switch there. And what Jesus is basically saying here, in the grand scheme of all this, is the last four churches are the predominant church types when the Lord returns. Okay? Because you will have the Catholic church as a predominant church type. You'll have the nominational church as a predominant church type. you have a faithful church, and we do have a lot of faithful churches, especially if you go over in other parts of the world, China, I would say most of the China churches are the Philadelphia churches. Any of those churches over in Iran, those small house churches that are popped up all over the Middle East and they're being persecuted. And finally, the apostate church. So these are, if you were to take now every church that you can think about, they're going to fall within one of these categories. Now you're still going to have a little bit of Ephesians here, Ephesus, you're going to have some Smyrna, you're going to have some of these things. But... Most churches are either denominational, you think Methodist, Presbyterian, okay? They're either Catholic, you have your persecuted small house churches, and then you have what we see like the church in America, your apostate churches. And why are they apostate? Because they've compromised with the world, like the church at Laodicea had. The, the Laodiceans had to compromise with the world. So that's the reason for the switch. Now, I want to... There's an inscription in a cathedral, and we're going to close with this. Thus speaketh Christ our Lord to us. This is a, in Lübeck, Germany. There's a cathedral, and there's this inscription that's outside the cathedral, and it says, Thus speaketh our Lord to us. And, and as I read these off, I want you to think about yourself. Because these hit me, and multiple of these nail me right between the eyes. You call me master and obey me not. You call me light and see me not. You call me the way and you walk me not. You call me life and choose me not. You call me wise and follow me not. You call me fair and love me not. You call me rich and ask me not. You call me eternal 
and seek me not. You call me noble and serve me not. You call me gener uh, gracious and trust me not. You call me might and honor me not. You call me just and fear me not. If I condemn you, blame me not. So, one thing we want to talk about is Laodiceans. I think if you look at the church in America, and what we're going to do specifically next week is look at the, the church in America. And I've got the, uh, the reading um, that we'll, we'll look at here, what the assignments are this week. And, I hope, and I'll have it in the email, but I hope you guys, uh, I need you really to pay attention to these. And as I told you last week, I want you to read them in, in context of, the, the, of where we are today. Not just at First Baptist Rocheron, but also in America. What you see, you know, it's what Chuck mentioned, I guess, last week about there's a, a former Southern Baptist church who ordained the very first Southern Baptist minister. Used to be a major player in the Southern Baptist Convention, and they have now compromised with the world withdrawn from the Southern Baptist Convention, you know, about 20 years ago, but have now come out and compromised with the world and said that they will ordain homosexual clergy and they will perform same-sex weddings. Because that's where the world is and that's where they need to be. I believe those are almost his exact words. So as we look around, uh, we see that. And we especially see it in America, but also don't just, let's not just keep America in mind. Let's think about Western Europe. If you know anything about Christianity in Western Europe, it's dead. There are cathedrals, beautiful <clears throat> houses, quote unquote. Where's the house of the Lord? Here. Now, you, we, we, we kind of casually refer to this as the Lord's house. Thank you for being here on the Lord's house. Now, that, I think that's tragic. And even though I have said it, this is a building. Okay? It is a building. The house of God is here. The house of God, the Bible says, now dwells within men. Doesn't He doesn't dwell here. And in our house group, our house small house group, uh, he'll dwell there. Because where two or three of you are gathered for in his name, there he is in the midst of you. So we're going to take a specific look next week about the church in America, because that's where we live, but also understanding that a lot of churches in the Western culture have, you know, and, and, and what's the primary reason? It's the same reason that Church of Laodicea did it. What's the reason? Compromise. They've compromised, right. They've compromised with the world. Um, we've got this idea that we've got to be seeker sensitive. You know, we don't want to scare the, the new people off. And that's just, that's no, I don't see that here. I don't. And if that was the way the New Testament had founded the church, then Peter really messed up in the book of Acts when he said, you men of Judah who crucified the Lord. That's not a smart way to build a church. You know, I can see church planners and church consultants all over the, all over the planet going, oh, that's really stupid. But guess what? It's the Holy Spirit that builds. So are there any questions real quick? Any discussions? Okay, so next week, first of all, kind of a verse the same way that the verse we had out of Hosea is. This is the end of the matter. This is out of Ecclesiastes. All has been heard. Fear God, keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. That's your entire duty. You know, what does the Lord require of you? He requires you to, you know, seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before your God. You know, seek kindness. Uh, but he also has a duty for you, and that's for you to keep his commands and to walk in fear of the Lord. Okay? So for next week, we're going to look at the church of today. Now, here are your assignments. Paul deals a lot of, about this uh, 
with Timothy in, in First and Second Timothy. And the reason why is because Timothy was a pastor. And as you as you read these and as we discuss them, you will see. Okay, there I see a lot of similarities here. And so as I pointed out last week, read these in the context that these are talking about the church. It's real easy for us to say these are talking about the world. And, but I have news for you. The world's always been ungodly. The world's always been evil and cruel. The world. So if Paul is saying, hey, in latter days people are going to be bad, well, they were bad then, so what's the, what are you trying to get at? I don't get it. It's kind of like saying, you know what? A hundred years from now, apples will be red. All right? Or watermelon will be good. And for those of you who like watermelon. So, it's not a shock. But when you think about it in the context of, hey, this is, he's talking about the church. So, so we're also, next week I'm going to try to get Martha to print out uh, the, all the summary of what every church Okay, uh, so all the names of the churches, all right, all of what Jesus said about himself, this is his description, all of his commendations, his condemnations, his promises, and all these things. I'm going to get that printed out because as I pointed out to you last week, I want you guys to start thinking about rating our church. Where do we stand? How much, what kind of percentage are we who are of Ephesus? And what percentage are we of Laodicea? And what percentage are we of Thyatira? And you guys will need that summary. So I will get that to Martha, and we will have it next week. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this time we have spent together. We thank you for your word. Lord, help us to always stand strong on your word. Help us to always stand true to your word and to never, ever uh, compromise. Lord, I pray that for my brothers and sisters here, that as we leave today, that every one of us will take an accurate assessment of who we are. Father, we know that we're washed in the blood and we know that we, we, we love you, Father, and we know that, uh, that you have saved us. But Father, help us to examine ourselves. Help us to, uh, to check out ourselves and to look at every place, Lord, that is unglorifying to you and does not bring you glory in every place that we have, we have regarded sin in our heart. And Father, help us to clean those areas so that you may hear us. Because Father Isaiah 66 says, Lord, if we regard iniquity in our hearts, you will not hear us. So Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise in Christ's name.